So today we're going to take a look at Thick Again by Adam Grant. This book is about changing perspectives and developing a altering one's worldview and it's roughly divided into three uh, groups inside the book. The first is about changing your own mind and developing your own positions. The second is about interpersonal. Uh, it's about changing the minds of others. And then the third is more social, more broadly social, thinking about changing minds in a broader social setting. Most of the book falls in within the first chapter, or not the first chapter, the first section where it's talking about changing your own personal perspective. And I think this comes from the book and it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is that if you're trying to develop a really robust worldview, uh, then oftentimes, oftentimes what makes someone look smart or looks like they have a really good worldview is their ability to really defend their position quite strongly and not back down and just argue and kind of brutalize any sort of disagreement. But if you look at what it takes to actually develop your worldview and to... Because if you, if you just adopt whatever the first position you hear is, you probably are going to miss the mark a lot. So the ability to change is important. And so uh, I find it a little bit ironic or troubling or interesting that the thing that kind of will lend to creating a very strong worldview, which is the ability to change your mind, is the very thing that often can, not, can make you look uh, less intelligent in some settings. I think uh, Grant disagrees with this position a little bit, and there's like some nuance in there, but it's just something I've been thinking about because, uh, like, if you if you look at like videos of YouTube's that are compilations of people who are supposedly smart, looking smart, a lot of it is just them uh, kind of owning people in conversation, and so uh, and that's not really a productive way to converse. It's just performative because they're not really convincing the other person. Uh, in a lot of these cases, they are just kind of pandering to some sort of audience uh, who just wants to see them brutalize their opposition via rhetoric or talking points or what have you. Anyways, a little bit more back into the book. Um, so the first chapter, there's a lot of things in it that are pretty interesting. Um, they talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect, I think it's called, which is that oftentimes the people who think that they know best are... Uh, the people who know the least, and the more you learn, the less confident you get. Um, there's a little bit, uh, they show like this graph where uh, when you know nothing, you think you know nothing, and then as you learn a little, you think you know a lot, and then as you learn more, you think you know a little again, and then it swoops back up as you become like really, really an expert. And um, this kind of lends into uh, a bit of a characterization that they make later, like towards the back quarter of the section, which is they talk about uh, the armchair quarterback on one end of the spectrum who thinks they know better when they probably don't. It's like uh, watching, you know, Sunday Night Football, what have you, and thinking you know better than the coach when this guy's been doing this professionally for decades. Uh, if, he, if you know better than him, then, you know, but a lot of people act as if they do know better. So armchair quarterback. And then the at the other end of the spectrum is imposter syndrome, where you're actually quite competent, but your confidence is below your competence. So it's a bit of an interesting model. Uh, Grant is pretty good at using models or frameworks for explaining things. Uh, he makes this very accessible, even though he's relying a lot on empirical evidence. Um, you know, it's... Oftentimes these books can be quite a books that are more empirically oriented could be a little bit of a struggle because the authors are you know scientists whose primary uh primary function is like research and evaluating information and it's not disseminating information and so you have this oftentimes the books that are more rigorous are not as well written and i think grant does a pretty good job writing the book um so we have the dunning kruger effect and this preacher or sorry, not preacher. Uh, that's the next thing. And then also armchair quarterback uh, versus imposter syndrome uh, distinction. Another type of model he likes uses and he uses throughout the book is he makes the argument that generally speaking, when people are arguing in bad faith, they're arguing through one of three modes. And that is 
um, the preacher, which is, uh, you know, more emotionally oriented, uh, sticks to their position and will not really alter their position in the face of evidence. Um, and then there is the prosecutor who is more about making their opposition wrong than about actually convincing and they're really into arguing. And then there's also, um, confirmation bias. Like they will, you know, find information that supports their point and just relentlessly like batter it and kind of ignore information that doesn't support their point. And then there's the politician, which I'm having a hard time remembering the characterization of them. Uh, I, it's more that they are unqualified to make an opinion, but they are really sticking out like they really know what they're talking about because it makes them look better, if I recall correctly. The fourth one, which is the sort of idealized version that Grant argues that we should strive towards, is the scientist who um, cares about information, uh, is willing to be wrong, and is willing to update their views uh, in light of new evidence. Okay, and as the central thesis of the book is kind of, people are really bad at changing their minds. Changing your mind is really good in a lot of ways. You should be better about changing your mind. And in a general sense, I agree with this thesis. Okay, so the second section is about changing other people's minds. And um, I found this section to be quite interesting because uh, piling on points um, is generally kind of how people argue or just like really push through and never give ground. And what the evidence suggests is that this is actually just a terrible way to convince someone of anything. Um, generally, it just makes them kind of feel assaulted. Uh, and when trying to convince someone of something, uh, it's really important to give common ground and to give themselves a space that, you know, you're not coming after them. And it's... It's, so the example that gets used in the book is they, when they talk about, um, they talk about this guy who convinces a lot of people who are, you know, uh, vaccine hesitant. And this is like, not during COVID. I'm not talking about COVID vaccines. I'm talking about a whole slew of other vaccines because they think they cause autism. And this guy is particularly good at convincing people that they uh, should get their kids vaccinated. And the way he introduces it, or the way he does it, is not by approaching them with this, oh, you're crazy, if you don't vaccinate your kid, this is terrible, terrible parenting, blah, blah, blah. Which is often the approach that gets um, levied against uh, people who are vaccine hesitant. Instead, he says, he like opens up with something that is uh, creating common ground and recognizing that they are trying to do what's best for their kid, which is he's like, I just want you to know, regardless of what we talk about or, uh, you know, what happens, uh, I believe that you are trying to do what's best for your kid and I will respect your decision regardless of like what you want to do at the end. You know, it's and then there's this open dialogue for hearing what they have to say and what their concerns are and asking questions about their concerns rather than just like bombarding them with information. And so it's this, uh, it's this like give and take type of thing where oftentimes people feel that if you're trying to convince someone, you need to like win the argument uh, and not, never give any ground and never concede. When in reality, a lot of times, if you wanna convince someone of something and they have a concern and you concede that their concern is legitimate, that's actually a pretty good way for starting to get them to, uh, the give and take is what like really is good for convincing people rather than being obstinate. Okay. Um, another part of this section is talking, they talk about stereotypes and ways to bust stereotypes is often, you know, presenting uh, data sets when the stereotype doesn't fit or presenting data or experiences. Um, one particular example, he talks about Daryl Davis, I think it is, who is a uh, black musician who has conversations with KKK members and he convinces them to not be in the KKK. And uh, it's pretty interesting, uh, probably worth checking him out, like independent of this book. But um, one of the ways he does this is by having a dialogue with them 
And what he found is a lot of them have just never really interacted with a black person before. And so what happens is he kind of serves as an interacting force that challenges all these preconceptions that they have. And so oftentimes, and he doesn't come at them like hostily, he you know, asks questions and they have like a conversation. And once again, like, like the example of the guy with the vaccines, it's about creating a dialogue and addressing concerns and not just being dismissive and aggressive when it comes to changing minds. And I think that this is a particularly salient point because uh, what the public discourse looks like right now, at least in the United States, is just like, it's hyper-polarized and hyper-aggressive and uh, people are just not nice to each other and they're not trying to find common ground. And it's, um, the evidence suggests this is just a really bad way to communicate, um, both because it's, like, uh, it's aggressive and, not, like, I don't want to say not fun. I, it's not healthy. Um, not, I'm not trying to say that it's fun either. I'm just saying fun's not the right word. It's not healthy. Um, and, uh, you know, if you actually want to convince people, it's terrible as well. Uh, or at least this is what the evidence suggests, according to Dr. Grant, which I'm, uh, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, and then the third section, which is the smallest section, I think, I'm not 100% sure, he talks about kind of more bro broad social um, kind of ways of uh, thinking again. One example from that section is he talks about this teacher who wrote a textbook, and in the textbook... Um, Let's see. Uh, she uses, it's like talking about, she teaches middle school or something. It's talking about m middle schoolers today, and it uses a bunch of examples of students. And in it, all of the examples are girls. Um, uh, something like this, except for like there's one boy. And so she notes that the first time pre she presented this, a boy raised her hand and asked, hey, where are all the boys? And she responded, oh, there's one boy in here. Um, and then like... Uh, I forget exactly how the it was like the story was told in the book, but she says, um, "Oh, they were around then. They just weren't doing anything important," which is kind of you know the narrative that uh, is given for like what women were doing, like uh, in history where it's just like not reported on women doing anything uh, important. It's just like, oh, they are around. They just weren't doing anything important. I found that example particularly amusing and um, interesting. And the, the kid had like an aha moment. It's like, oh, I get it. It's like, this is how, uh, how history books are written really informs how people grow to understand things. And it's important and it's like built into our society and it's creates this broader, um, you know, perspective, especially because a lot of people, as the book uh, notes throughout the entire book, really bad at changing their opinions. So when you have this kind of way of constructing reality uh, for kids in history books, and this is, both sides think this is important in the United States, you know, regarding politics and stuff like this. When you have a, something in a history book, you know, it's, it's important because it, creates a perspective that's probably going to last a long time. Um, and then there's like an appendix with a whole bunch of like condensed information as well on like questions you should ask uh, for changing minds and like changing your own mind, how to challenge your own beliefs, um, revisiting your like career and thinking about that again. Uh, Cause you should think again, everything, stuff with kids, um, stuff like this. And so, Overall, uh, I think it's a particularly strong book. Uh, this book had an overall rating of, I think, 7.58. Let's double check. Yep. And this is the first time I've ever read a book and thought that the average score um, was perhaps, or like that, the average score that gets spit out because I just do an average for the overall um, is perhaps a little too high for uh, where I think the book's at. Not that I didn't like the book. I love the book book's fantastic but i think it should be like in the low sevens instead of the mid sevens anyways i thought that was a little bit interesting so let's get into the ratings for utility i gave it an 8.5 and i think this is why the overall rating is a bit high is because it's kind of a more informative book um but it's also useful and it's also relatively speaking entertaining and so for the usefulness i think that um 
the book is first of all the book's relatively easy to read and it's not that long it's like 270 pages and it imparts a lot of ways to reevaluate your beliefs and i think i've been exposed to some of this stuff before um, but if you've never been exposed to some of the ways in which we can become blind to you know how wrong we are about things then i think it's a really big eye opener and it's a really good look for changing your mind and secondly uh it's beyond this like worldview construction like internal like thing that i think it's useful for i think it's pretty useful for um conflict resolution and convincing people of ideas because of the second section of the book where you're talking about you know um how to articulate your point to people which doesn't involve just like bombarding them with evidence you know it's about creating common ground and asking questions and like this sorts of things and i found that that was particularly useful as well and then there's the third section which is perhaps less applicable because most people aren't in charge of like what textbooks kids read um or like the broader social things but it's still pretty interesting uh for novelty i gave it a 7.5 i feel like a lot of these ideas are really good to know but perhaps they're not the hardest to find like i've read about the dunning kruger effect elsewhere um you know i've read about imposter syndrome armchair quarterback type stuff elsewhere we have like biases towards thinking we're right and like these sorts of things these these aren't impossible to find in the in the realm of psychology but i do think that they're really important to know um i think that in a lot of cases people are really <laughs> i think the premise of the book is really spot on people are really bad at um knowing when they're wrong and they're really bad at changing their own opinions and so uh, i do think that this is important information to see at least once and so that's why it scores high on novelty more so than um it being information that's necessarily obscure you haven't seen before hard to access this sort of thing entertainment i gave it a 6.5 i actually think dr grant's um writing given that is mainly an informational book uh, i found it quite entertaining for that type of book um his writing is um both like upbeat and informative and there's like a bunch of incidental things in there that are uh, entertainment, like inter entertainment, entertaining, uh, like little comic stripes and like this sort of thing and um, lots of visual aids. And so uh, I think that he he hits he makes it like very accessible and like not like hyper theoretical but he still gets the information across in a robust way so i scored pretty high on entertainment and also that's kind of an explanation for why style looks good as well for readability once again really easy to read he has a whole bunch of visual visual aids in the book like an example is like this is his preacher versus uh what is it the four that he writes scientist preacher prosecutor and um politician okay, let's hold this up for try and get a little bit closer and so um he has all kinds of stuff like this throughout the book which makes it quite easy to read also i think that um like this is about stereotypes here's another one um and so i think that this makes the book quite a lot easier to read and i think that his um his book is like just generally easy to read um so scores high on readability for interest i gave it a seven um which is a relatively high score i think a lot of the information is interesting and none of it is i i didn't think there were too many parts where i'm just like reading and i'm thinking okay this is like theory and like it's not that interesting or what have you you know most of the most of the stuff is um it feels like readily available in terms of like applicability to my life at least in the first two sections um and so i thought that the book was fairly interesting as well overall score of 7.58 and so which is quite high um and i think it's deservedly quite high um i'm still on the fence on goodreads so like on goodreads i i barely give out fives uh, five stars it's like one to five stars and i'm still trying to think whether i want to give this four stars or five stars um but as far as recommendations go uh broadly speaking um 
this is kind of a book I would recommend to a very broad swath of people, especially because it's a combination of like easy to read. I think the information is pretty useful. And um, like if I'm going to recommend nonfiction to someone and I want that nonfiction to be informative, uh, this is going to be like one of the books I kind of like look to recommending. I also really like Adam Grant's like social media presence. Um, I follow him on Instagram, but on Instagram he just reposts his Twitter posts and so pictures of his Twitter posts. And I think that he's it's a pretty good look um, for. I think that he is good at conveying information in a nuanced way that is like robust and good information while still being like obviously like within a character limit or it has to be in a picture like within the constraints of social media which often social media lends to sensationalism and i don't think he's sensationalistic i just think he puts out good information and so i would recommend um broadly speaking to anyone um take a look at uh, adam grant on you know social media uh, and then if you kind of like what you see, I would recommend this book, definitely, but perhaps also one of his other books, which I haven't read, so I can't, like, completely vouch for. But I would recommend him pretty broadly to anyone, really, because uh, developing your own worldview and convincing people of your position and reaching common ground and consensus, uh, these are things that I can't think of a I can't think of like a type of person where this isn't useful for. And so it leaves me in a bit of a spot where uh, I, I want to say I just recommend it to everyone, but I don't recommend nonfiction to everyone or like nonfiction books. And so, you know, uh, I do think it's pretty broad in terms of who can read it and who can benefit from it. Um, as far as discussion goes, what is the biggest uh, change that you have had uh, in terms of changing your worldview. And I think there's a lot of things to pick for for me, but I'll just give an example for me that I think is particularly big. And that is um, when I used to think that competition had some sort of transcendental status as being truth revealing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the best way to figure out what the best way to do something is, is to have a competition for it and then whoever wins that competition you just model them and so like if you want to get good at basketball you find the best basketball player you look at what he does and it's like that's what you do and it's this uh i viewed competition as this sort of gauntlet where you throw in the ideas and, or like the methodology and whichever one comes out that one's best and so like another good way of thinking about this is like uh, a mixed martial arts tournament where you have specialists from every martial art and you just throw them in and whatever, whoever comes out on top, that's the best way to trade. Okay. Um, and then I often try and balance when I really think of a position in this case, competition's truth feeling in like a way that's like, I wouldn't describe it as transcendental, but like nearly transcendental. Um, uh, I try and balance it by reading something I think I'm going to disagree with. In this case, I read um, this book by... It's The Case Against Competition. I forget who it's by. Um, it's probably going to come to me later. But he makes a case that, in a lot of ways, um, creating a competition out of something creates a lot of problems. And I can't remember, like, all of the evidence. But I remember just really being gobsmacked and, like, just completely... My position developed in a very nuanced way. I still think that competition is a good, like, looking at competitors and what they do is, like, a good way of uh, going about modeling or, like, figuring it out. But it's not the be-all, end-all. A lot of times, um, you know, people could just not be drawn to competition or what have you, and they can be doing something better to be getting good. Um, and a lot of times competition has negative uh, psychological effects, especially like in the workplace and stuff, having people compete with each other is like, it leads to behaviors where they are incentivized to undermine each other, these sorts of things. And so I really changed my opinion on competition. Um, I have a book review in here somewhere of that. Um, maybe I'll put that in the comments or not the comments, the, the description. Um, but I remember that was a time I really changed my mind about something and did like, 
I don't want to call it a 180 because I still hold a lot of these views on competition being, you know, a really good way of finding out what's effective. Um, specific, like in the, the mixed martial arts example is like a really good example of like uh, how I think you figure it out. Because everyone like, everyone thinks their martial arts are the best, but you know, you think yours is the best till you get punched in the face. Uh, uh, but I do, I also think that it's not, it's not just like categorically the best always, that sort of thing. Like, I think that competition has definite drawbacks. It just is a good way of sorting out, um, you know, methodologies in a particular way, but it's not necessarily the frame that you want to be operating under because it has negative psychological effects. Anyways, I don't want to turn this into a video on competition. Also, I'm not prepared to speak on competition. But that's an example of uh, somehow uh, one way I changed my mind. So that's the first discussion point. And the second one is, when was the last time you looked for information contradictory to your perspective? And like, what was it? This sort of thing. Um, I think is another interesting discussion topic. Anyways, if you like this video, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, feel free to comment just the algo, all this stuff, and have a good day.